And like we do with all of our events, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm going to ask Twasif Haman, come on up and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Including the unborn. Thank you, Twasif. So the Republican women of Dane County welcome you tonight. I am Nancy Bartlett. I am president of this group. Um, a little bit of a commercial about the Republican women. Um, we do a lot of a variety of things. We do a lot of events. We do lunches. As a matter of fact, Governor Walker and the First Lady joined us for lunch in March. Uh, we do a lot of community outreach. And I will tell you that Republican women are very politically savvy. And we know how to get the jobs done. But yeah, I agree. I agree. And we would like to invite anybody here to come and join the Republican Party of Dane County or any Republican women's group throughout the state. As a matter of fact, we have our state federation president here, Robin Moore. And I'd be willing to bet she could answer any questions about other, other clubs within the state, any of them. Um, I would also like to just uh, mention a few of, are there any other Senate candidates in the room? I don't think so. If you are running for any statewide office, would you please stand? Right, Robin, that's you too. I will mention that Jay Schrader over here is running for Secretary of State. And um, if you might recall, there is somebody there right now that probably shouldn't be there any longer. So please vote for him. In the, you don't have a primary, right? So vote for him in November. Yeah. We are very proud for, of all the candidates that step out and, and uh, take a leap of faith and become a candidate because that says a lot about their, their integrity, their fortitude, and their commitment to the Constitution, to the state, and to our national uh, stage. So they, you know, when you see a candidate, make sure you say congratulations and thank you. The, I'd like to also mention, um, where's Billy Johnson? Billy Johnson over there does our pints and politics for the Republican Party of Dane County. And he is combining um, pints and politics with the forum tonight. If you see some people maybe you didn't know before, um, that's because um, we have a few extra people that are here tonight, and we're glad to have them. Um, I also wanted to mention, before I forget, because I forgot my sheet, where is Lynn? Right here. Lynn, what is the, you, she, the we have uh, a Twitter feed, and it is? Um, the hashtag tonight I'll be live tweeting is hashtag WISENforum, so W I S E. Did everyone hear that? Okay. So Wisen, W-I-S-E-N, forum. So if you want to jump on the Twitter feed or um, you want to do, do some, you know, tweet yourself, feel free. Because I know the campaigns are doing that. Um, this is also being uh, live streamed by Wisconsin Eye. Um, and you will be able to, to see this. You can go on, I, I just Google it, and you can go on and you can watch what's, what's going on. Um, so we're very glad to have them. And hopefully we'll have even a few more media here. We have media all the way from Addison to Milwaukee, and we have a lot of people in the audience that just want to learn a lot more about the candidates. So let's cover some of the rules. So we've done the flip, 
and Kevin will be standing over here because she's taller, and uh, Leah will be standing at this podium. Kevin will start. They'll get three minutes to um, do their open, and Marilyn Stodder over here is our moderator. She's a past president of the Republican Women of Dane County, and she has some experience doing the uh, moderating. So we are very pleased that she's doing this she tonight. She means talking. I have experience. <laughs> what was that? I say you mean I, she has experience talking. Well, <laughs> she is part of the women's group after all. What, what can I say? <laughs> um, now I lost my train of thought, Marilyn. But we also have a timer, Samantha right here will be, will be timing and she will be very strict on the, uh, the timing of that. Any other questions? Candidates, are you ready? I will bring to the stage Marine and businessman Kevin Nicholson and state senator and military mom, Leah Voltmere. Give him a hand. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I'm first, right? Just kick off with the opening statement? Okay. Yes, please. Well, how's everyone doing? Good. Beautiful summer day. We're all in here, but there's air conditioning, so that makes it okay. Uh, well, hey, folks. I'm very much looking forward to having the opportunity to talk to you all and to share my vision for what we should be doing in the United States Senate. I know many of you have heard me say this before, but this isn't a game. This is the United States Senate. The docket that's at play here and what you're going to be doing on a daily basis as a United States Senator involves who lives, who dies. Does this country go to war? Are we growing and prospering as a society? Are we adhering to the principles upon which this country was founded in the first place, which basically say that your life matters, born or unborn, your rights are given to you by God, and your government does not have the ability to interfere with that. That's what's at stake here. That is what, as a day, on a daily basis, you're going to be dealing with as a United States Senator. And that, frankly, and this is why we are all so incredibly disappointed with Tammy Baldwin, because she doesn't think about this stuff. In no way, shape, or form is she thinking about how we perpetuate the principles this country was founded on, how we share these lessons with Americans and Wisconsinites all across our great state, how we create a more prosperous and more secure nation going forward where we're all given an opportunity to truly succeed no matter where we come from, no matter what we look like. That's not her message. But that is, what, that is what is at stake in this election. And my promise to all of you is this. I'm going to take that message of trying to find a way to make our state and our nation more secure and more prosperous to every single corner of this state. And I will tell you today, it is going to take an outsider to credibly deliver that message to beat Tammy Baldwin and then to go to Washington and actually do things differently. And I mean differently. I mean being willing to be just a one-term senator, if that's what the people of Wisconsin decide. I'm okay with that. Because my goal is going to be to go to Washington and deal with the problems that we have. The overspending that threatens that safety and that security and that prosperity that I talked about. Bad foreign policy decisions like the Iran deal that the president was right to pull out of and John Bolton was right to advise him to pull out of, but that Tammy Baldwin was one of the first United States senators to jump on board with. Those are the stakes. And that is the case we need to make to the people of the state of Wisconsin that we as conservatives every single day are thinking about how to safeguard their rights, push responsibilities and resources back down to their families so they can go out and do great things. That's our goal. And that's going to be that message that I bring to the people of this state. And I will say again, the people of our state have made it clear, whether in electing Ron Johnson or voting for Donald Trump, that they expect outsiders to go to Washington to do things differently and to put this country on a path to success. And that's why we're going to win this election. Well, thank you very much, Dane County Republican women. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Marilyn. Really appreciate you all coming out here tonight. It is an honor for me to stand before you as the endorsed candidate by the Republican Party of Wisconsin. And I thank all of you in this room who were there to support me at convention. Most of you know my story. I'm a mom with a cause who never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be running for office. 
I got into politics out of circumstance, not ambition. I began an odyssey, an odyssey of going to school board meetings and writing letters to the editor and asking questions about why government was controlling my life in a way that I did not like in my daughter's classroom. That odyssey took me for 10 years and then I ran for office. I had the opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with Governor Walker as we broke the stranglehold of public sector unions. It wasn't easy, but it was the right thing to do. And so many of you in this room were there and supported us each and every step of the way. And think about what we have done since that time. We have created an economic miracle in our state. This miracle has made a difference in the lives of Wisconsinites. And it's something that we need to take to Washington. I call it the Wisconsin way, and we need to take that Wisconsin way to Washington, where we are going to once and for all balance the budget, replace Obamacare, and build that wall. People are looking for strong leaders to go to Washington to stand with President Donald Trump and follow through on the promises that were made at that election. It's what I have done for you here in Wisconsin. I want to take those changes to Washington. I've seen it. I've done it. I'll do it again for you in Washington. Thank you very much. OK, we're going to begin with our questions. And how this will work is you will both get the same question, but not at the same time. So if you hear it. Listen for it later if it's not your question at the time. Kevin, we'll begin with you with the questions. The new tax bill is a major accomplishment for the American people. How will you promote the tax bill? Well, I think one of the things we have to be remind uh, the people of our state, and frankly, the United States Senator has to remind the entire country, is take a look at your withholding. Take a look at your paycheck. Money that was being held overseas has been brought back into our country to the tune of billions of dollars, which companies are now reinvesting in themselves and in their people. Real-time pay raises were given out by corporations and companies across this country and in our state. That's real. Nobody can take that away in any way, in any shape, or in any form. That is the president, again, as an outsider, coming and saying that we need to do something different. How many career politicians have we heard in Washington say things like, well, there's nothing we can do about it. All that money is locked overseas, and it would be too hard to actually break this and change it and then put into effect a real tax policy which is competitive with other nations across the, uh, across the globe. It took an outsider to go and say, we will do this. And frankly, and this is what I appreciate about the president and what we have to echo back, I think, throughout, um, throughout this entire state and country, is that politicians don't create jobs. I think you all know that. But what they can do is create an environment in which companies and people prosper. That is the goal. And when we push resources back to people, which that tax policy does, then people win. Leah, question for you. President Trump has seized, has, excuse me, has voiced a desire to withdraw from Syria. Some conservatives believe this would be a serious mistake. What is your view? Well, obviously, I take this very seriously as I have a son in the military. He's a first lieutenant in the United States Army, and he recently completed Ranger School. And so I'm very concerned about what happens on a global scene in terms of our military. The good news is that he hasn't announced a timeline for doing that, which is something we all recall that our previous administration did, and that puts our soldiers at risk. I think that pulling out of Syria can only happen once we know that there are no longer safe havens where terrorists have the ability to continue to terrorize overseas and to plan attacks against our nation. So until we have taken care of those safe havens, I hope that we are able to stay there um, and continue to make sure that we root out that evil that wants nothing more than to take down our principles, our ideals here in this country and across the globe. So again, I'm very cautious as a mom of a son in the military, as I'm sure all of you in this room are. Um, we have to make sure that, that we secure that area before we pull out. And then we have to let that area, the, the countries in that region, step in 
and decide how to con continue going from that point on. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, this, is one, this one is for you. Okay. Higher education costs are skyrocketing. What do you believe is the solution to the student loan crisis? And as a senator, what policy would you propose? So having attended a few very expensive institutions of higher education in my life, which was, was a good experience on the whole, but I've seen this up close. Let's talk about the practicality of higher education in this moment in our society. First off, we've never had so many people going on to uh, post-secondary education in all of human history. This is new. And it's been largely financed by debt, which has been encouraged uh, by the federal government uh, for both families and students to take it out. What's happened is that has fueled uh, constant raises in tuition, which have exceeded inflation in real time. As administrators have seen this cheap debt flood into their schools, what have they done with it? Have they, <laughs> have they increased the quality of education? No. They have blown out their, their bureaucracy and their administration. And they found all sorts of fascinating basket weaving departments to add to their, the various universities, and that's highly problematic. So what we need to do is drill down and talk to the students and their families about how do you properly invest in higher education and how do you find the right education for you. Going forward, we shouldn't be having students finance this all with debt. We should be finding a way to condense post-secondary education so it's no longer a four plus year experience. That means yes, students going to school over summer and going full time like it's a job. So you can get onto the next step of your life quicker and be more productive and not launch into adulthood with debt. Now these are real changes. This isn't me just standing up here like a politician talking about nonsense. These are real changes to higher education that will launch people into their lives sooner and let them successfully take on the next step of their life. And then when it comes to debt, I think that all students and their families need to be counseled very carefully and said, and, and, and I would, this is good regulation before they take on debt, have a class that's gonna say, look, here's what that's gonna cost in real time once you graduate. Is that really what you want to add on top of your rent payment, your mortgage, or your car payments? And actually dis discourage people from taking on the debt that they are now, finding ways to condense education, make it quicker so they don't have to debt finance. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Leah, everyone is concerned about school safety. What should be done to keep our schools safer? Well, obviously this is a very important issue that is burning on the minds of people all across this country. And uh, first and foremost, um, we must remember the tragedies that have occurred. And my heart goes out to all those families that have been affected. One of the things that typically happens, though, when a situation like these tragedies occur is there is a quick and immediate call to control guns, to take away Second Amendment rights. Most of you know in this room that I am a strong supporter of our Second Amendment rights. And unfortunately, what's happening in our schools, and I think about it also as a nurse in our hospitals, our children, our patients, our medical professionals are sitting ducks in environments where guns are not allowed. So I think what we need to be doing when we think about these situations are allow local schools, local school districts, local communities make the decisions that are best for them. Now what we have done here in Wisconsin is we have given money uh, to the schools across the country, to make it across the state, to decide what they want to do in terms of school safety. That is a start. Um, but we have to continue to also look at underlying problems. At the federal level, it's really important that we are looking at our reporting system, that we are making sure that these red flags that keep coming up in one situation after another aren't missed. And we have to make sure that we are dealing with the underlying issues of mental health. We have to look at those before we start talking about taking away our rights to our Second Amendment. It's the Second Amendment. Our founding fathers thought it was that important. And I think it's possible for us to take care of our children by giving local schools and local units of government the ability to make the decisions that they think are best. And if they think that they should arm individuals in that school, then that's the decision that I would support. Thanks, Leah. OK, Kevin, you want to applaud? Go ahead. <laughs> Kevin, what would you do as a senator to strengthen the military? 
So, I mean, obviously a topic near and dear to my heart. I served for five years in the United States Marine Corps. I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what I think you need to, to keep in mind here is that we have probably the lowest uh, participation rate in Congress uh, on the part of veterans that I think we've probably had ever in our nation's history. There's not enough members of Congress who can sit there steely-eyed and sit across from the Pentagon and say, good investment, bad investment. I want strategic invest investments in defense. Let's keep in mind that the most expensive investment the Pentagon makes is actually in human capital, people. Why? Because they live a long time, then they retire, they have a pension if they go over 20 years, and they have health care. So actually, it's the human capital, the people, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that costs the most in the Pentagon. So we need to be smart about how we invest in people, how we develop them. There's a nasty habit we have in our, our country, one that's very much supported by Tammy Baldwin, where Democrat presidents get in and hollow out the military for the period of time that they're there. And they, they create gaps in human capital and talent. And it's very hard for the military to make that up by then getting more soldier sailors, airmen and, airmen and marine to join up. That's not an easy thing to do. So when I say strategic investments, I, you need to think long term about what do we want our force to look like in 10 or 20 years. Technologically, sure, but people wise. And then as a member of the United States Senate, you need to be able to sit across the Pentagon and say, look, I get that Congressman X from Texas really wants you to build that missile, but that missile clearly is not the right tool for our soldier, sailors, airmen and Marines to use. And that means having, again, the spine and the knowledge base and the willingness to stand up and say we're going to do the right thing because this is what ultimately secures the principles in our Constitution. And I will. And I'll circle all this back and remind you the only way you have that steel is, frankly, you've lived a life to, to, to train you to do it. But second, you're willing to lose an election. I don't care if defense contractors uh, support my campaign. I do care if the American people do. Thank you. All right, let's take a different tack, Leah. Health care costs are still rising in America. What proposals do you have to help cut health care costs? Well, obviously, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart as a nurse and someone who has continued to work in health care through my years in the legislature. I have had the ability to help my team in Madison as we've had to deal with the effects of Obamacare as it trickles down to us at the state level. It's very simple what we need to do for health care. Uh, when Obamacare went into place, it was, we certainly had, um, did not have a free market health care system. There was a lot of government involvement, and Obamacare added layers. And what we should be doing is peeling away layers. The easiest way to talk about how we transform health care is that we need an army of consumers with information and tools with which to make decisions about their health care. It's that simple. The army, it's you. Every single one of you has to have the ability to have information that is very sim simply transparency, just like when you go in for your car checkup, that you know exactly what an oil change is, you know what a tire rotation is. You don't have that right now. That is very important data. You also have to have the tools to make those decisions. You have to have control over your health care dollars so that you don't go into the emergency room at 3 o'clock in the morning for something that could wait until 9 o'clock the next day. Once people have control over their health care dollars, they have the information, the tools, they are going to make smarter decisions, and we have the ability to start a competitive marketplace. The next thing we have to do, the most important thing, is to have the ability to create insurance products that are different. Right now, they're all the same. They all have the same essential elements. Remember the day when we talked about shopping across state lines? Well, that's because there were different elements in each health care uh, product. Right now they're the same. Why should a 20 year old male need to have care for OBGYN? So we have to have the ability to create the products. This will infuse the competition that's necessary. So army of individuals with information and tools to make decisions about their health care to create the competitive marketplace that will lower the cost of health care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, we're going to switch back to you, and you get the question that Leah had a little while ago. What are your thoughts about keeping our schools safer? Well, uh, let me first share a bit of a light-hearted anecdote about this, but it's relevant. Um, 
Today, actually, my wife directed me to bring a aquarium full of tadpoles to go see my young daughter, um, Emily, who was doing a show and tell. We've been raising tadpoles in our class. And so as I went to the school, um, I had to enter through two different checkpoints, and I had to scan my driver's license before I was able to get into the building in the first place. That is the right situation right now. There is no two ways about it. I was talking to a deputy recently, a sheriff's deputy, and what he said to me is like, look, what, what's your answer? Like, what do you, what do you want to do about this? Because the threat is real, and it's here, and it is. So, and, and he'll remind me, and he, and he did remind me, to remind everyone here that he doesn't have enough in his budget, and there's not enough coming for him to put an armed police officer all hours of every day in every single school in his county, let alone the entire state. So let's start by hardening these targets, and we must, and that means the security checkpoints that we talked about, or that I just mentioned right now. But also, too, it means, yes, when and where we can, armed uh, police officers in schools right now. And then when we can't have that, armed security guards, and then we can't have that, trained volunteers who go to live fire training on a consistent basis so they are prepared for the challenge of what they're offering themselves up to do. Now, look, I'm just being realistic. Tammy Baldwin would sit here and say, I want to take away your Second Amendment rights, even though you are a law-abiding citizen, and it's not actually going to keep your children more safe. Because ultimately, that's what she wants to do, and this is a crisis that she can try to do it in. My answer is, you are law-abiding citizens. The Second Amendment exists for you to be able to protect your life and your rights given to you by God. Now let's go about hardening the targets in which our most precious assets spend much of their time, and those are the schools. And we will do that. It is the right thing to do. And we have to meet this threat where it is, and then long term start to solve the problems that societally are ill. That includes treatment of mentally ill, and finding ways, again, to harden targets where, where our most precious assets are living. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. All right, Leah. Agriculture is a big part of the Wisconsin history and our economy. The 2018 Farm Bill is receiving much attention. As a senator, what priorities will you bring to the table to help Wisconsin agriculture? Well, first and fo foremost, the Farm Bill should be a Farm Bill. It is not. And I'm sure most of you know that a very small percentage of the Farm Bill deals with farming. And I think you need to have people who are strong to go up in, to Washington and say, these two different items don't fit together. In fact, we can't even do that in Wisconsin. Bills that have different ideas and approaches cannot be combined. And we need to have people who know that, understand that, and are willing to go to Washington and say, we need to separate this out and clearly focus in on the issues that affect our farming industry. And clearly Wisconsin is a state where farming is important. And we also have to understand that our farmers are subject to issues and conditions that they can't control or beyond their means. So we always have to make sure that there is that safety net, understanding that our farmers are in a situation where things may not go well in a particular farming season. And so it's very important that moving forward that we have individuals in Washington who understand that, who are willing to stand up for our farmers and say, let us focus in on farming issues so we're not trying to pass a bill that has something that has nothing to do with farming. All that will do is water down the farming bill and not pay the proper attention to the needs and concerns of our farming industry. Thank you. Kevin, what are your thoughts about the president wanting to withdraw from Syria, and um, do you believe it is a mistake, or what is your view on this? Well, let me share my, my principles on the deployment of American lives in any armed conflict, and I think that's the most important thing. One, crystal clarity and mission, an achievable mission that everybody down to the brand new private fully understands, number one. Number two, overwhelming and crushing resources, human and technological and capital, put into it to win the fight fast. Because folks, fast fights save lives, both American and also to local nationals. That is simply the way it is. Long wars are bad things. And we're seeing that in real time today. Then, a, a realistic plan about who we're going to leave behind. We're still in Germany and we're still in Japan. Now, we're there for strategic reasons, but we're still in Germany and we're still in Japan. So let's be honest about what happens once you start a conflict. And then a realistic plan to take care of everybody once they're home and their families. 
That is a real obligation. How many members of the Senate or Congress do you think really go through that mental exercise when someone comes to them and says, I have a fight, I want to pick? Not enough. These are your children. They get one go around on earth. Heaven everlasting may be our reward, but you get one go around here. Your rights, your life are given to you by God. They are not mine as a United States Senator to toy with. If I'm going to authorize people to go to war, whether in Syria or anywhere else on earth, it's going to be because I believe that it is ultimately going to protect the principles upon which this country was founded. And I'm going to make darn sure that those that go to fight are there to win, win quick, and that we have a plan to bring them home. And that's the way it has to be going forward. And boy, you'll never see me back a deal like the Iran deal, which sends cash on a cargo plane to a state sponsor of terror that's killing us in both Iraq and Afghanistan, because that's what Tammy Baldwin did, and that's why we need to get her out of the US Senate. Leah? As a senator, what would you look at when deciding whether to confirm a Supreme Court justice? Well, this is very simple. Somebody who is going to have a strict view and be a strict constitutionalist. Uh, to me, our Constitution is not a living and breathing document. Or as somebody said to me once when I was knocking on doors, it's just a quaint old document. We don't have to pay attention to it. Justice Scalia once said that the Constitution says what it says and says what it doesn't say. Something to that effect. But he said it, he made it so clear to us that we should know what's in that Constitution and we should elect people who stick to what the Constitution says and not try to legislate from the bench. And we have all seen that here, especially here in Dane County, haven't we? And we have to have people who understand the differences between our branches. What is the role of the executive branch? What is the role of the legislative branch? What is the role of judicial branch? And we have seen it firsthand here in Dane County. And I was very proud to be a part of a piece of legislation that made sure that we changed where the venue of starting a lawsuit is. It always used to happen, thank you, here in Dane County. And then the appeal was in the appellate court in this same area. So we had the same liberal judges over and over again legislating from the bench. That's wrong. We need to have individuals who will look at the Constitution, know what it means, know what it stands for, and follow it as a book and as that sacred document that our founding fathers developed and envisioned, and it still holds true today. Thank you very much. Kevin, the agriculture question to you. The 2018 Farm Bill is receiving a lot of attention. As a senator, what priorities will you bring to the table to help Wisconsin agriculture? Ask any farmer or rancher what they need, and I've worked a bit in agriculture when I was a ranch hand uh, in my younger days, and I've seen that it is a tough business, and it is a hard way to make a living with all sorts of regulatory taxation and other types of hurdles, environmental hurdles. Farmers need markets. They need competition, which is fair. So in other words, they don't need to be competing with subsidized products coming from other countries or dealing with tariffs put on their products as they ship abroad. We have the best farmers in the world. We do. They have the ability to feed the world. They need access to markets. One of the things I think the president has done extremely well, even though we had politicians criticizing him for doing it, is say, look, I want to move to a world without tariffs. But to do that, I'm going to threaten use of tariffs on countries that are trying to block American goods or pose tariffs on them or subsidize the production of their goods and give unfair advantages that we don't currently give to our farmers and our manufacturers. So as farmers, what they want, they want to be able to compete. They want to be able to get out there. They want to be able to sell their product to obviously, yes, of course, the people of Wisconsin, the people of our country, but abroad too. And they want to know that when they go into those foreign markets and they bring the best products in the world, that they're going to have the ability to sell without others trying to shackle them and get them out of the marketplace. So that's what we need. We need United States senators that understand that these farmers are business people. They're out there turning out a great product, and they're working really hard to do it with a high risk threshold. What we need to do as the people that represent them is get out there and kick open the doors and the markets that they currently can't compete in. And then say to those that want to sell their products in the United States, hey, you're welcome to. But you don't get to give unfair advantages to your producers if you want to come into our markets. 
That's what our farmers want. They want a fighting chance to get out there and succeed, and I'm going to give them that in the U.S. Senate. Great. Thank you, Kevin. All right, Leah. The tax bill is a major accomplishment for American people. How will you promote the tax bill? Well, you promote it by continuing to create changes to the, the tax plan as it exists. You don't, you don't stop right where you are. Look what we have done here in Wisconsin. We have been able to create $8 billion in tax relief. We have gotten rid of the alternative minimum tax. We have gotten rid of the state property tax. And we have started to peel back the personal property tax. Senator Ron Johnson was pivotal in our tax bill. People were very frustrated with him because he dug his heels in at one point. And people thought, oh no, he is going to foil this bill. But what Senator Ron Johnson did is he understood the process of making the bill better. But at the end of the day, he knew that I'm going to take what I can get this time around, and then next time we're going to come back and we're going to get more. When I travel around this state and I listen to people, and they talk about that extra $2,000 that they have in their pocketbook that they can spend on their family, their children's, for books, for clothes, whatever. These people don't call that breadcrumbs. People like Nancy Pelosi and Tammy Baldwin. It's real money, it's significant money, and we need to continue to do that because as people have more control over their health, their, their dollars, they infuse that into the economy, and we continue to grow the economy, and we allow individuals and families to prosper. So we need to continue to march down that road just like we've done here in Wisconsin, and every opportunity that we get to reform that tax code, we do it to make it simpler for every single individual in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin. What should the United States do to create a comprehensive strategy and to better prepare for cyber warfare? So, never fight the last war. It's a problem every general has always had. You're always gearing up for the last war. But as you think forward as to where technology is going and where the threats really lie, we oftentimes in this country, those that are concerned about cyber warfare, talk about uh, our electrical grid in this country and how susceptible it is to attack. Now think about that just for a moment. The electrical grid. What happens when that grid shuts down to the most susceptible amongst us? People die from heat. People in hospitals in the middle of a surgery hopefully have a generator to back up, but it will it last long enough. We've seen what happens in Puerto Rico when a civilization goes for extended periods without power that they need. We need to harden targets, and I talked about this just a moment ago with schools and school safety. We need to invest strategically and intelligently and think about, again, the next conflict. Because there are so many different ways that our enemies are thinking about trying to strike and hurt the American people. And certainly there is no doubt that cyber warfare is part of it. And so structurally the electrical grid is part of that, but then let's think a step further about that. Our financial system, our currency. It's not backed up by gold anymore, folks. Think about our, our, the intellectual property of the intellectual capital, really, of the American people that exists in so many different companies and institutions. We have great resources, no doubt, in the federal government, but we need to think about how we're pro providing a comprehensive shield to the American people and as well to American corporations and how we're educating those corporations and preparing them for the future. Because a fair amount of this is education, preparation, and thinking forward and trying to war game this whole thing out so you're thinking like the bad guys do when they come after you. The other thing, I, you hear all this stuff about China uh, downloading so many different intellectual property pieces and, and different uh, uh, schematics for different fighter jets. Boy, I would put maybe some Easter eggs in those schematics so that when they do, their computers fry out. Something I might consider doing in the future. That's just me, though. If the NSA is listening, you might want to consider that, too. Thank you. All right, Leah, do you think that the responsibility of the Department of Education should be given back to the states, and why? Absolutely, yes. 
Uh, we all remember that Ronald Reagan tried to abolish the Department of Education, and it, it is not something that has been enumerated as something that the federal government should even be involved in. Uh, we need to bring that back to the states where we know how to take care of things. I'm a strong proponent of federalism, and it really means that when you look at not only education, but you look at health care, we know how to take care of our citizens better than the federal government. So let's get the federal government out of education as much as possible. A common Core, for example, get rid of it. It doesn't belong in our schools. We have to continue to let parents make the choices and options and the decisions for their children that they know are best. It's something that got me into this in the very first place, being concerned about what was happening in the classroom. I trust parents to make the right decisions for their children, and that's why I have been a part of the school choice movement, and I'm excited that we have been able to start with a small program in the city of Milwaukee, and now it has grown to a statewide program. So that individuals, not just those in the city of Milwaukee, but now we've expanded it, are able to make the same decisions for their children, that people have the ability to send their child to a private school, to send their child to a charter school, not everybody wants to send their children to a private school. To allow individuals to continue to homeschool if that is their choice. All of these options have to be preserved and protected. The federal government will only come in and continue to mire this down. We have to make sure that we allow those decisions made at the local level by the parents. I trust the parents. And that is why I also sponsored and made sure that we got through a a special needs voucher bill. It is something I've worked on for many years and we finally got that through. Those parents in particular know best what their children need and we have to support them all the way. Thank you, Leah. Kevin, health care costs are still rising in America, so what proposals do you have to help cut those costs? Look out 10, 15 years at the federal government and where the budget's going to be at, folks. We, we say, and you, I know many of you heard me say this before, we say we're $20 trillion in debt. We are so much more than $20 trillion in debt. If you accurately as assess and account for the long-term health care obligations just found in Medicare and Medicaid, let alone the, the, the health care burden that many of us are going to carry in our private lives going forward, it is trillions of dollars more than 20. And so all of us should feel that we have a real problem here and it's going to affect future generations, generations not yet born that are having promises made on their behalf yet paid out today. It's a real issue that we need to actually deal with. Now, what's missing from healthcare? Healthcare is one of the most regulated, one of the most regulated industries in our country. Well, market choices, market forces. Price transparency, consumer choice, the ability of you as healthcare consumers to actually make rational choices in your lives. I, I tell the story often about my son got hit in the stick with an eye and I went to the hospital and they asked me immediately, what's your deductible? I was like, don't worry, it's a lot more than a cut over the eye cost. No, it wasn't. Thousands of dollars later after x-rays and all sorts of other things which weren't necessary and no one knew what they cost, including myself and the medical professionals, we'd racked up thousands of dollars in bills. We need to interject price transparency, consumer choices, and you as consumers need to be able to keep your money in healthcare savings accounts so you can spend it intelligently. Once you do that, the aggregate cost of healthcare will come down as prices come down. And both private consumers of healthcare, insurance companies, and the federal government will benefit from these, these market choices. Absent that, healthcare spending is going to consume our entire federal budget at one point. We need to fight back against this with the common sense market forces that direct every other industry in our country. And the sooner we get to it, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Leo, what would you do to strengthen the military? Well, first and foremost, we have to support our president and what a president he is. When I think about my son and the fact that before the November election, he told me, Mom, I'm seriously rethinking my career to the military if Hillary Clinton is elected. The morale in our military was so low before that election. But the excitement that has been generated since President Donald Trump was elected has just been amazing. 
Because finally we have a leader who is standing up to foreign powers, rather than bowing to them. We all remember President Obama bowing to foreign leaders, both literally and figuratively, it was wrong. So we need to stand with President Donald Trump when he calls for increasing our military. We have to make sure that they have the right technology. Sadly, we're hearing over and over again about accidents that are happening with our, our warships, with our planes. This is wrong. It's because the previous administration decimated the military. And so I'm grateful that we have a president who is standing strong and believes in a principle of another president we all remember, Ronald Reagan, peace through strength. So we need to stand with him. We need to make sure that he is surrounded by the military experts who know what is the best for our military and making sure that we're giving him the opportunity to listen to them and follow through on making those best decisions so that our young men and women, brave young men and women, are able to go into battle to protect our freedoms on a daily basis, knowing that they are properly equipped and properly prepared. And I'm willing to stand with the president to make sure they are. Thank you, Leah. Kevin, as a U.S. Senator, what would you look at when deciding whether to confirm a Supreme Court justice? Well, how about humility? Understanding your role in a larger system, a system of checks and balances. Whether it's a U.S. Supreme Court justice or a federal judge, whatever the case might be, you as a senator have an obligation in this system to look for nominees that understand the construct in which they're about to enter. In that construct, we do not have a super legislature which happens to wear black robes. But those liberal members of that bench, whether it's the federal bench or the Supreme Court, sure think that's what they are. They're not. And that's why, and, and the Democrats are so upset about this, but so many people now vote on the basis of which president, and sometimes senators, are willing to nominate and approve which court nominees. Because liberal justices and jurists have decided to usurp the legislative and sometimes the executive process and hold it for their own. It doesn't work. That is a system of government running away. And it is not the way our republic is designed to work. It's one of the reasons you see so much frustration in American politics. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Why are people getting so angry about things? Because they feel like the power which is supposed to exist with them as they elect a legislator that represents their interests and balances off against an executive and a judiciary is all being slipped away by people that are appointed for their entire life and decide that it's up to them to decide how this country should be run. It is not meant to work that way. Those checks and balances are there for a reason. So that humility, that understanding of being a strict constitutional originalist, to know that your job is simply to interpret what has been written by the legislature and ultimately approved by the executive before being put into law. And that is as far as your responsibility goes. And if you want to make laws and write laws, go run for the United States Senate. Thank you, Kevin. Leah, what should the United States do to create a comprehensive strategy and better prepare for cyber warfare? Well, this is a very frightening issue indeed for all of us, and I'm grateful that we already have people like Senator Ron Johnson who have been looking at this issue, in particular the issue having to do with the um, electronic grid, and we need to make sure that we surround him and others and have more leaders go to Washington who understand the importance of this. You know, one of the things that Donald Trump um, is known for, and as we talk about this uh, trade and the tariff issue, um, we know that Donald Trump is doing this for one reason, because he knows and he has seen that China in particular is not only eating our lunch as it relates to trade, but they are stealing our technology and forcing our companies to turn over their trade secrets. This is a real problem. And so we need to make sure that we are training people in cybersecurity, people that we who will understand exactly what needs to be done. And we need to make sure that this is a priority because this is one of the reasons why President Trump has been looking at this issue from the terrorist perspective. Because he knows, 
he knows that we are losing on that ground and he wants to make sure that we have fair deals. He believes in free markets, as do I, but we have to have fair deals and we have to prevent countries like China from continuing to steal our technology and put our country at risk. It's frightening to think about it. When I think about working in a hospital and working in an intensive care unit and to think about lives that are just would be held in the balance, but now we're talking about our entire cybersecurity for our country. Education, understanding, and surrounding ourselves with those experts who are going to make this a priority so that we can keep our country secure. Thank you, Leah. Kevin, do you think the responsibility of the Department of Education should be given back to the states, and why? Well, I, folks, a lot's made about how I was once a Democrat, right? Anybody ever hear anybody say that? I used to be a Democrat. <laughs> well, <laughs> since before I was a Republican, heck, since before Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, Republicans have been saying they're going to defund the Department of Education. You as conservative voters should be sick of that, because it never happens. The question is, let's get to incentives and let's fix it. Well, how does Common Core work, right? I mean, let's talk about the math of this whole thing. They use grants to incentivize behavior. Well, first, they take the money from your, your paycheck, then they push it up to the federal government, push it back down in the state in the form of a grant, it's the most inefficient process in the world, incentivize a behavior on the part of a local school district and say, hey, if you want the money, you got to do this. Enough of the school districts switch over and say, okay, we need the money, we will do that, because you took the money out of our local communities in the first place. They get enough local communities to do that so that the textbook makers are like, well, I guess everyone's doing Common Core now. <laughs> and so guess what? Now you only have a couple different textbook makers out there, and they're all producing the same thing. So even if you're in one of those municipalities that stands strong and says, oh, we don't want Common Core, you only have a certain amount of books to buy. That's how it works. So dial the whole thing back, and instead of me just saying to you, well, I'm going to get rid of the Department of Education, and you all saying, yep, that sounds like a good idea, and then we're all talking about it again in, tw in six years, how about we get rid of their ability to give out grants? How about we stop it right where it is? And then maybe the Department of Education is a little bit less interesting to those on the left, and they're not as excited about it anymore. And we can start to whittle back at that thing, put it back into a cage, and push that money back all to you so you can invest in your local communities. That makes sense to me. It's a real solution. It can actually happen, and it will disincentivize those on the left from using the Department of Education to try and push their views on people that don't have any interest in it. And we can get back to math that, frankly, I understand, because I'm confused by my kids' homework now. <laughs> so let's get, let's get to that. As, hey, I went to Harvard, and I can't do fourth grade math suddenly. Um, so let's use the power of the purse intelligently. Let's cut off uh, the snake at its head, and let's actually get some changes instead of just keep saying the same thing over and over again. Thank you, Kevin. Leah, higher education costs are skyrocketing. What is, do you believe is the solution to the student loan crisis? And as a senator, what policy would you propose? Well, this goes hand in hand with what I said earlier. This is a classic example of where the federal government should not be involved. And, and it's a lesson for all of us that when government does get involved, it messes things up. And so we have to get the federal government out of the business of, of loans. It has set up our kids for failure. We have kids who are going into college and they are racking up tens of thousands of debt and they're coming out in a job where they're only going to be making $30,000 a year. We need to get out of that business altogether. We need to return as much power as possible back to the states. Because once again, the states understand what to do. And look what we've done here in Wisconsin. We have frozen tuition year after year after year for our students. That's how you allow students to make responsible decisions. The other thing that we have to do, and this isn't an, uh, something that a lot of people find popular, but we have to think about it more and more. I think we're doing a great disservice to our children when we're constantly thinking that the only avenue that they can go into is a four-year college education. We have manufacturing jobs in our state that are really good paying jobs. And we're steering kids into four-year colleges. And a lot of this is, yes, because guidance counselors get the credit for however many kids they send to Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth. But we also have a situation, too, where parents think that 
Well, let's face it, we all think that our kid is going to go to a four-year Ivy League school, but not every child is going to succeed, and we are setting them up for failure. So we need to have programs, as we have done here in Wisconsin, where we are encouraging our youth to go into the areas where they are going to make well paying, sustaining jobs for their families, and also meet that need in our state for filling those jobs. We have manufacturing jobs and people who are aging out, and we need young people to get up. So let's get the government out of it. Let's focus in on finding opportunities for children that may not necessarily fit that same mold that we've always thought about. We have to start thinking out of the box. We've done that here in Wisconsin, and we need to do that in Washington. Thank you, Leah. Now, I, the next two questions for both of you are the same question, and then we will go into closing remarks. However, we were wondering if any of you had an opportunity to write out a question on a three by five card. If you took one, Nancy has a basket to collect it. If not, we're not taking any questions from the audience verbally, but if you had an opportunity to write one down. Where do you get a card? Where do you get a card? No. All right. We'll bring you, we'll bring you cards. Don't repeat anything I've asked, okay? All right, while they're doing that, Kevin, yes. this is the same question I'm going to be giving to Leah. We always hear, I'll do it differently. I'm not going to be part of the swamp. I'll stand up for Wisconsin and Washington, D.C. Why are you different? Folks, I don't want to join the club. That's it. That's the incentive, right? Like, you want to be part of the club, you're going to immediately start to erode your principles. Someone, you've all heard these stories, right? I know I have, talking to legislators about, oh, you get locked in the basement of the Capitol and they yell at you and tell you what to do. Why? Why don't you kick down the door and leave? The only reason you don't kick down the door and leave is because you're worried they're not going to fund your next election. And if you're willing to do this, and uh, folks, we just raised a million dollars in the first quarter of this year, and no professional politicians were helping us do that. But if you're willing to actually say, hey, look, I'm here to serve the people of Wisconsin. I'm here to, to uphold the principles the country was founded upon. And ultimately, if you, you, the people of Wisconsin, decide to send me home after six years, I'll be content with that. I might think you made the wrong choice, but life moves on. I have to do the best I can while I'm there to make the right decision. And boy, that is so fundamentally different than so many members of Congress view their responsibilities and their obligations. They think it's their responsibility to be a US senator, to win the next election. But that's not it. The, the goal is not for me to become a United States senator. The goal is to go to Washington to represent the people of the state of Wisconsin and help solve the problems and open up a future of prosperity and security for the people of our state. That is the goal of this whole campaign, my whole team, and all the people that are supporting us, including the 9,000 plus uh, small donors we have in all 72 counties of this state. And they know darn well the reason they've invested in my campaign is they understand I'm not going to be part of the club. I've already capped myself at two terms. I've done that for a reason, to take my mind out of the process right away and say I am there for the people of Wisconsin. I am not there to be a United States Senator, and you can bank on that. All right, thanks, Kevin. All right, Leah, tell us, why are you different? Well, they often say that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And I've always uh, followed the beat of a different drummer. I asked my mom that question. I've always bucked leadership, asked my mom that question. Look, I think it's incredibly important that you look at somebody's past behavior. I am a proven, consistent conservative. When I got into the state assembly and the state legislature, I was a handful of uh, a minority. I was a handful, too, I guess, <laughs> for leadership. <laughs> there was a small number of us conservatives. And I will never forget being told that if I continued to vote with the conservative wing of our party, I would end up being a backbencher. When that member of leadership said that to me, I said, buddy, you said that to the wrong lady. Because I'm voting with the people back home. 
the people who asked me to be their voice in Madison. And I will never forget that because we gradually grew our majorities to the point where look what we have been able to do here in Wisconsin. And you all stood with us. You stood and prayed for us and fortified us when that capital was under siege. That pressure of walking in and out of that building with armed security, leaving through secret tunnel ways that I didn't even know existed, having personal death threats. Let me tell you, if I can withstand that pressure, I can withstand any pressure in Washington. I have never forgotten my conservative principles. I have gotten things done. You can count on me to do the same in Washington. All you have to do is stick to your principles. Remember where you came from. Remember who elected you to be their voice. I have been the voice of my constituents in the 5th Senate District, and I will be your voice in Washington. You can count on it because I've already done it for you. Thank you. I'm going to see if there's any questions for you guys. Hang on. You redeem them at McDonald's afterwards for a small ice cream cone. <laughs> Nancy, am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, here's a question. I, I think we'll change tack a little bit and let you both answer the same question, all right? How will you get the voters to turn out? The Republicans have just lost a district up north and a Supreme Court seat. Kevin, let's go to you. Folks, many of you heard me say this so many times, it is going to take an outsider to win this election. I mean, let's look at when Republicans are winning these federal offices. Ron Johnson, straight from manufacturing into the United States Senate. Donald Trump, well outside of politics, won Wisconsin a route to winning the presidency. There are people throughout our entire state who understand full well, full well, that Washington is so fundamentally broken that if you're coming from a political system, wherever that political system may be, you are not going to be able to create the problems that were created by the political class in the first place. Insiders have created a system for them, by them. Talk trade, talk international relations. How many people in that town, and that, I mean, Washington, D.C., have convinced themselves that, hey, you all just need to deal with the mistakes that they made? Whether that's on trade, whether that's on international relations, North Korea getting a nuclear weapon. And then they all condescend to President Trump and other outsiders who go there and say, this isn't okay. We need to do this differently. And I, I credit the president, yes, for coming well outside of politics, for dealing with all the naysayers on the inside. I may have some experience with that myself, maybe. And just doing it anyways, because it's the right thing to do. And look at the body of work and the track record. And nobody but a political outsider would have been able to accomplish what he has accomplished to this point. And you all know that. You have to be willing to break the glass, break the norms, do it different, and understand the urgency of a republic which is throttling towards a cliff. Trillions of dollars in debt. Way too many people in Washington making money as we hurtle towards that cliff. And understand, you're not there to be their friend. You're there to represent the interests of the people of Wisconsin and uphold the principles upon which this country was founded at all costs. And that's what I will do. Same question. The grassroots of Wisconsin, it's where I got my start. Mom of the cause. As I have traveled all over this state, it has been so great to connect with all of you because each and every single one of you in this room remembers the moment that got you off of your couch and into your local GOP headquarters where you picked up a clipboard, you picked up a phone, you picked up a bag of lit, and you went out and you connected because you were passionate about an issue. I know those grassroots, because that's where I started. And I am so proud that almost 73% of the grassroots in the state of Wisconsin have endorsed my candidacy because they know I am a proven leader. And we have proven results in Wisconsin. The list is amazing. You all know it, but I'm going to go over it again. Collective bargaining reform. We are a right-to-work state. 
We have expanded school choice. We have allowed for our Second Amendment rights to be protected through a variety of ways. Castle Doctrine, repeal of the 48-hour waiting period, concealed carry. We're protecting the dignity of life. The list goes on and on. Prevailing wage repeal. All of these things will be unraveled if we allow the Democrats to get in control. And that's how you motivate people. That message of what we have done, how we have turned this state around from a state that had a 9.3% unemployment rate to a 2.8% unemployment rate, a state that had a $3.6 billion budget deficit to now a state that has a surplus, that it's giving back money to the people. This is how we sell our message. We have all been a part of this economic miracle. It's been amazing. People all over the country look to Wisconsin because we have led. And now you need to send somebody to Washington who knows how to get it done. I've seen it here. I've done it. I'll do it again in Washington. It can be done. We will do it together because we've done it here in Wisconsin. OK, thank you. Okay, many of the questions have come in similar, so I'm kind of combining them rather than read each one because it'll be the same question over and over. Um, so this one, let's start with Le Leah on this one. Since politics appears to be so vile today, the Madison and the Milwaukee papers, which we're mostly concerned with here, will probably lie about you and your family. So can you convince us that you have the fortitude to put up with the media in the swamp? And this is for both of you to answer now. Go ahead, Lita. Well, I've already been called vile. I've already been called Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> I've already been called every single name under the book. And they all give me those names because why? Because they know that I stand for our conservative principles and I get the job done. Look, I am not afraid. They can call me any name in the book that they want. My strength and my fortitude comes from my belief in God. It comes from my belief in this amazing country and the Constitution upon which it was founded. And when you have that in your corner, you can withstand anything that they throw at you. And I stood in that Capitol for hours and hours and hours on end. Shame, shame, shame. The things that they threw at us, the names that they called us. And yes, I mentioned it before, death threats, a personal threat to my family and my children, explicit. I know where you live. I know where your children live. I know their name, their names, and we will find you and put a bullet between your eyes. Yeah. I withstood that. If I can withstand that, I'll take any name they want to call me from the Journal Sentinel and whatever paper wants to call me something. Thanks, Leah. <laughs> Kevin, how about you against the media and the swamp? Well, look, I, I've had people try and kill me for what I believe. I'm fortunate they didn't succeed. But there's nothing I wouldn't do to uphold my principles. That's the way it is. So you can call me names. I mean, look, I've had people in our own party say that I have no real principles because they're on the opposite side of a primary from me. Water off my back. I'm doing this because I'm worried about the future of this country. And I am. I know you are all too. The question is, how do we solve our problems and how do we fix this? Look, I'd prefer the press write down what I'm really saying. <laughs> I know they won't always, and that's life. But I can't sit around and get upset about it. I'm going to make sure that my kids aren't watching TV. <laughs> That's probably just a good rule in general. But you have to come into this understanding what the stakes are. And again, it's a question of, is this republic going to stand for not just another 100 or 200 or 300, but another 10,000 years? Will future generations that we can't even imagine look back on this truly exceptional experiment and say, that was it? That's what launched humanity into this epoch and gave us the true value of our lives. We can do that. We, the American people, can do that. 
But we have to stick to these principles, and we can't let the naysayers, you can't let whatever, the media, the Democrats, or, or whatever, get in your way. In fact, you want to go out there and win them over. And I don't mean by catering, I mean by saying, I'm going to challenge your thought processes, I'm going to provide better ideas, and I'm going to put forward policies that actually work. That's how you win, not just this election, which we're going to win. I'm going to beat Tammy Baldwin. But that's how you win the future of this republic. And that'll never be forgotten on my campaign. Thank you, Kevin. All right, this is for both of you a little bit of encouragement from one of our guests here tonight. I came to vote for one of you, or make a decision to vote for one of you, but I would be proud to have either of you. You both will Thank you. Thank you. You both will easily beat Tammy, and I personally know her, and she just cannot compete. So, so th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we're we're ready for the closing remarks, and one of the last questions is, why vote for you and not your opponent in the primary? So now your two-minute closing remarks are going to tell us that. So Leah, you begin. Shortly after Donald J. Trump was elected President of the United States, the 45th President of the United States, I began a journey that brought me to this point where I stand before you. I have traveled 65,000 miles in my car. I have been to all 72 counties, most of them more than once. And the excitement of that evening continues today with the prospect of replacing Tammy Baldwin with a proven, consistent conservative who will truly represent our Wisconsin values. People are looking for strong leaders, people who will stand up for their principles and get the job done. As a nurse, I understand the complex issues surrounding our healthcare system. I have helped our team here in Madison. I will go to Washington and once and for all repeal and replace Obamacare. As an NRA member and proud gun owner, I have protected our Second Amendment rights. I, here in Wisconsin, I will continue to do it in Washington. As a military mom, you know I want a strong military and I have defended our guard and our veterans here in Wisconsin. I will do the same in Washington. As the daughter of Greek immigrants, I grew up in a big fat Greek family. I believe we are a nation of laws. We must uphold those laws and we must go to Washington and help Donald Trump build that wall. As a woman of faith, you have my word that I have been and I always will be 100% pro-life. That's all I know. These are the principles that I have heard from all of you as I've traveled this state. And I listen because nurses listen. And these are the qualities and the characteristics that I have followed through for you here in Wisconsin. And you have no worries or question that I'm going to do that in Washington. I've seen it. I've done it. I'll do it again. The stakes are high. The problems in Washington are great. We can't afford to take a chance on the unknown. You must elect a proven, consistent conservative who will follow through for you. You have my word on it. I'm asking for your vote in August, on August 14th, and again in November. God bless you, and thank you so much for all that you have done for the state of Wisconsin. We have made Wisconsin great again. Now let's send the right person to Washington to join President Donald Trump and truly make America great again. Thank you. Kevin? I will, only, I will not let you down, and I'm not going to fail you. We're going to beat Tammy Baldwin. But more importantly, when I go to Washington to represent your interests and to secure the future of our republic, you know that every day that I will be there, I will bring the same determination, the same attitude, and the same relentlessness that you've all seen in this campaign. It's the only way I know how to do this. Don't buckle. Never ask permission to do the right thing. Ask advice, sure. Never ask permission to do the right thing. You've been sent there by the people of Wisconsin to do the right thing. We're winning this primary today. We have almost 9,000 small donors in all 72 counties across this state. 
I'm thrilled to have the endorsement of senators like Ted Cruz, Senator Mike Lee, John Bolton, people I know that you all respect. You respect them because they don't buckle. Because they're not in Washington to be senators or to be national security advisors, but to win the future of the country. And no one can doubt that about those people. The reason that they're on my team is because they understand I'm the kind of reinforcement that they need and they know that there's nothing anyone can do to make me buckle. The Taliban tried and they failed. Washington is not going to win. This republic is truly exceptional. So many people have sacrificed so much for us to be here today and taking part in it. So people have made permanent sacrifices and it is on us to justify the permanence of that sacrifice. And folks, on that night in November, when I beat Tammy Baldwin and we win this election, what I'm not gonna feel is any sense that I just won the lottery, but I'm gonna feel the burden that the people of Wisconsin have placed on me, along with the honor of going to Washington to secure the future of that republic. And that will never leave my mind any day that I am your United States Senator. God bless you, our great country, and our great state. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Please give them a, a, a very loud applaud. They did a great job.